I awoke with a queasy feeling in the pit of my stomach. Amel's hand rested on my back while the other attempted to intrude into my private area. A pounding headache plagued me, unrelated to the wine I had consumed the previous evening at the charity gala. Amel, darling, you know I'm not a morning person, I muttered, gently pushing his hand away. Sorry, Scarlet, he whined, sounding like a petulant child denied a treat. But what about all those stories of you and Aiden's passionate all-night lovemaking sessions back in the day? I sighed heavily. I was 22 then, ah male. Young, naive, and deeply infatuated. At that age, fueled by raging hormones and romantic notions, you can thrive on a diet of desire alone. Oh, he said, deflated. Ah male resembled a sad golden retriever puppy, making me question my life choices for the umpteenth time. On paper, I had made the sensible decision. I had traded in a workaholic 45-year-old husband who spent his free time tinkering with his vintage Porsche for an attentive 32-year-old boy toy who worshipped the ground I walked on. Aiden, though never violent or overtly controlling, had a maddening habit of smirking condescendingly and walking away whenever I put my foot down during an argument. That infuriating, you're being irrational, look made my blood boil. If I denied him intimacy, he would just shrug nonchalantly and head to the garage to tinker with that damn Porsche he loved more than me. The irony? Withholding physical affection turned my once confident, charismatic husband into a stammering fool, just as my mother had predicted. But a few days into my sex embargo, I noticed Aiden had developed a new quirk, obsessively checking his watch and calendar, with next weekend circled in bright red. It didn't add up until I found a brochure for a high-end brothel hidden in his sock drawer. The cover featured a bevy of scantily clad vixens eager to satisfy my husband's needs for a hefty price. I saw red. He had some nerve, thinking he could cast me aside for a cabal of money-hungry mistresses the second I failed to keep his manhood content. I knew exactly how this would play out. He would serve me with divorce papers faster than his precious Porsche could go from zero to sixty. So that night, swallowing my pride, I propositioned Aiden. I was a woman scorned, humiliated, my heart shattered into jagged pieces. But I would be damned if I let him discard me so easily. Come on, baby, it's been over a week, I purred running a provocative finger down his chest. Let me take care of you. Not tonight, Scarlet, he replied coolly, brushing me off like a piece of lint on his impeccably tailored suit. I'm just not in the mood. I saw Red again. How dare he reject me so callously? I, Scarlet Rose Winthrop Ashford, who could have any man I desired with a coquettish wink and a come-hither smile? But Aiden, damn him, seemed immune to my feminine wiles. He always managed to maintain the upper hand in our twisted power struggle. I had tried every trick in the book, every piece of advice gleaned from glossy magazines and gossipy brunches, but nothing could break his ironclad will. Enter Amel Davenport. Sweet, devoted Amel, who gazed at me like I was Venus incarnate. Amel, who would gladly be my willing slave, catering to my every whim and fancy. Amel, who made me feel desirable and adored again. So why hadn't I left Aiden for Amel yet? If I was brutally honest with myself, it boiled down to two reasons. One, despite the resentment and wounded pride, I still loved my maddening, emotionally distant husband. We had built a life together, and the thought of throwing it all away made my stomach churn. Amel, bless his besotted heart, was broke. He worked part-time as a bartender and was still finding his footing in the world. Meanwhile, Aiden raked in a high six-figure salary as a corporate attorney. The lifestyle I had grown accustomed to didn't come cheap. Perhaps that's where we went wrong. The money, the status, the material trappings, they had slowly chipped away at the foundation of our once unshakable bond. I yearned for the early days, when Aiden and I were just two crazy kids crazy in love, ready to take on the world together. But twenty years, divergent priorities, and countless petty squabbles had forced us both to fortify our defenses, transforming our grand love story into a never-ending cycle of icy silences and scorching resentment. As I pondered the slow decay of my marriage, Amel's gentle caress jolted me back to the present. He was trying his best to comfort me, unaware that his touch only served to fuel my inner turmoil. When Aiden touched me like that, it set my soul on fire. When Amel did it, I just felt numb. I asked Amel to come closer and massage my chest, craving a distraction from the war raging in my head. He eagerly obliged, but his inexperienced fumbling only made me miss Aiden's skilled hands more. My ample breasts, much like my platinum blonde tresses, were artificial enhancements paid for by my husband. The surgery had left me with reduced sensation in my nipples, 
a fact Aiden had leveraged to his advantage. He knew just how to play my body like a finely tuned instrument, leaving me boneless and quivering. It was hard to believe he had never strayed. Even harder to believe he still loved me, in his own dysfunctional way. That would make this next part especially difficult for him. But it also meant I could go crawling back if my plan went awry. If I was completely honest, I never would have considered leaving Aiden if he had just let me win an argument from time to time. If he had let me take the reins like a good husband should, we could have been blissfully happy. I would have been the perfect doting wife, and he the most satisfied man on the planet. But his stubborn pride and my wounded ego had erected an impenetrable wall between us. It was Amael who made me realize my true worth. He said that women held all the power, while men often ended up groveling at their feet. Amael himself had been living with a girlfriend who was desperate to marry him, but he felt no real connection with her. He assured me that leaving her would be as easy as changing his coffee order. I had to admit, he had a point. He seemed surprised that I agreed so readily. Men could be so naive. Today is the day, Amel whispered, his hand still clumsily kneading my breast. The day you're supposed to make the call, remember? Suddenly, it all clicked into place. The plan we had been meticulously crafting for weeks. The opportune moment we had been waiting for. This week, the stars had finally aligned in our favor. Aiden was out of town on business, and neither Amel nor I had the stomach for a face-to-face -face confrontation. The mere thought made my insides twist into knots. I may have been a selfish, conniving woman, but I wasn't completely heartless. Aiden deserved better than to be blindsided by a phone call. He deserved a proper sit-down, a chance to hash things out like civilized adults. If we determined that our marriage was unsalvageable, then and only then would I broach the topic of divorce. He would be a free man, and I a free woman. We could go our separate ways with some semblance of dignity intact. It wasn't the most honorable course of action, but it was the one we had chosen. In over two decades of marriage, Aiden had never once raised a hand to me or even his voice. He was a good man. Flawed, but fundamentally decent. When we fought, he tried to meet me halfway. It was infuriating. He was always so willing to compromise, to find the path of least resistance. And if I refused to budge, he would just flash me that insufferable little smirk and walk away. I knew that look all too well. It was his way of saying, fine, be that way. But don't expect me to give in to your unreasonable demands. If you won't meet me in the middle, you won't get a damn thing. Over the years, my bitterness had grown like a cancer, slowly consuming me from the inside out. I wanted it all, the house, the cars, the bank accounts, the investments. I wanted to bleed him dry, to make him pay for every perceived slight and injustice. I had consulted with a ruthless divorce attorney, had the papers drawn up and ready to go. I had vented to my mother and my socialite friends, all of whom had assured me that I would take Aiden to the cleaners. But their encouragement only made me feel more conflicted. Even my mother, who had never been overly fond of my husband, thought I was being rash. Maybe a part of me wanted her to talk me out of it, to be the voice of reason. But I was too far gone, too consumed by my own ego and sense of entitlement. I knew Aiden would be blindsided, but I figured he was a big boy. He would lick his wounds and move on. Besides, if I had sat him down and hashed it out like he wanted, he probably would have found a way to talk me down, to make me see the error of my ways. No, this called for drastic measures. It was a classic case of, do unto others before they can do unto you. I took a deep, fortifying breath and picked up the phone. Amel intensified his clumsy ministrations, his eyes locked on my chest as if he could will me to go through with it. I could hear the rumble of trucks pulling up outside, probably a furniture delivery for the new neighbors. The noise only added to the charged atmosphere, the sense that something momentous was about to happen. With shaking hands, I dialed the number I had called a thousand times before. It rang once before connecting midway through the second ring. It was almost too perfect, as if he had been waiting for my call. Aiden? I asked tentatively, hating the way my voice wavered. Who else would be answering my phone? He replied, his tone casual and unruffled. His nonchalance only made me feel more guilty. He was right. I couldn't remember the last time I had called him just to talk, just to check in and see how his day was going. This man had spent the better part of his life providing for me, and I had repaid him with cold indifference. Maybe this was for the best. Maybe we both needed a clean break, a chance to start over. I could let him keep a little more of his money, be the bigger person. I didn't need to destroy him. I just needed my freedom. I'm your wife, I reminded him, 
trying to inject some steel into my voice. I was so close to liberation I could taste it. I could feel Amel's sweat dripping onto my chest as he continued his clumsy caresses. I know that, Scarlet, Aiden sighed, sounding more exasperated than angry. But why are you calling me in the middle of a workday? You never call me at the office. I swallowed hard, my mouth suddenly dry as sandpaper. This was it. The moment of truth. The point of no return. Aiden, we need to talk, I began, my voice trembling with a mixture of fear and anticipation. I think it would be best if we did this in person, when you get home from your trip. But I need you to know. I trailed off, suddenly unsure of how to proceed. Amel, sensing my hesitation, began nibbling on my earlobe, his hot breath sending shivers down my spine. Need me to know what, Scarlet? Aiden prompted, his voice tinged with impatience. Spit it out. I want a divorce, I blurted out, the words tumbling from my lips in a rush. I'm not happy, Aiden. I haven't been for a long time. We've grown apart, and I think it would be best for both of us if we just went our separate ways. There was a long, heavy pause on the other end of the line. For a moment, I thought the call had been disconnected. But then I heard Aiden take a deep, shuddering breath, and I knew he was still there. I see, he said finally, his voice eerily calm. And does this have anything to do with the man who's been sharing your bed for the past few months? My blood ran cold. He knew. Of course he knew. Aiden was many things, but he wasn't stupid. He had probably known about my affair with Amael from the very beginning. H, how did you know? I stammered, my heart hammering against my ribcage. I'm a lawyer, Scarlet, he replied, a hint of condescension creeping into his tone. It's my job to know things. Did you really think you could keep something like this from me? I opened my mouth to respond, but no words came out. I was completely thrown my carefully laid plans unraveling before my very eyes. Here's what's going to happen, Aiden continued, his voice taking on a hard, steely edge. You're going to hang up the phone, pack your bags, and get the hell out of my house. You can have the clothes on your back and whatever personal items you can carry. Everything else, the house, the cars, the bank accounts, the investments, they all stay with me. You can't do that. I cried, finally finding my voice. I'm entitled to half of everything. I'll take you to court, ah. Oh. You'll do no such thing, Aiden interrupted, his voice dripping with disdain. I've already filed for divorce on the grounds of adultery. I have proof of your affair with Amael, and I'm prepared to use it. If you try to fight me on this, I'll make sure you walk away with nothing. Not a penny. I was stunned into silence, my mind reeling with the implications of his words. He had outplayed me at every turn, had anticipated my every move. I had underestimated him, and now I was paying the price. Aiden, please, I whispered, my voice choked with tears. Can't we talk about this? Can't we try to work things out? It's too late for that, Scarlet, he replied, his voice softening almost imperceptibly. You made your choice, and now you have to live with the consequences. I loved you, I really did. But I won't be made a fool of. Not again. With that, he hung up, leaving me listening to the dial tone with tears streaming down my face. Amel, sensing my distress, tried to pull me into his arms, but I pushed him away. Get out, I hissed, my voice trembling with rage and humiliation. Get out of my house and don't ever come back. Amel, looking hurt and confused, gathered his things and slunk out of the room like a kicked puppy. I barely noticed his departure, too consumed by my own misery to care. I had lost everything, my husband, my home, my financial security. I was alone, adrift in a sea of uncertainty and regret. As I sat there on the bed, my tears soaking into the silk sheets, I couldn't help but wonder where it had all gone wrong. When had I become so selfish, so entitled, so willing to throw away a lifetime of love and commitment for a fleeting moment of passion? I thought of Aiden, of the man I had once loved with every fiber of my being. I thought of the life we had built together, the dreams we had shared, the obstacles we had overcome. And I realized, with a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, that I had thrown it all away for nothing. For a man who didn't love me, for a fantasy that could never be reality. I had been so focused on what I thought I wanted, on what I thought I deserved, that I had lost sight of what truly mattered. And now, it was too late to go back, too late to make things right. As the trucks outside rumbled away, taking with them the last remnants of my old life, I buried my face in my hands and wept bitter tears of regret. In that moment, I realized the full extent of my folly, the depth of my betrayal. 
I had not only betrayed my husband's trust, but my own values and principles. I had allowed greed, selfishness, and a misguided sense of entitlement to cloud my judgment, and now I was paying the ultimate price. The days and weeks that followed were a blur of pain and humiliation. I was forced to move in with my mother, who alternated between offering me cold comfort and harsh criticism for my actions. My so-called friends, the very ones who had egged me on and assured me that I would come out on top, suddenly found excuses to avoid me. A male, predictably, had vanished without a trace. I suppose I couldn't blame him, after all, I had been the one to cast him aside in my moment of despair. Still, a part of me had hoped that he might reach out, that he might offer some semblance of support or understanding. But no such solace was forthcoming. I was well and truly alone, left to pick up the pieces of my shattered life and try to make sense of the wreckage. In the months that followed, I consulted with a string of lawyers, all of whom delivered the same grim prognosis. Aiden had played his cards masterfully, and there was little I could do to challenge the terms of the divorce. He had been ruthless, yes, but he had also been well within his legal rights. I had gambled everything on a foolish, ill-conceived plan, and I had lost spectacularly. Now, I would have to pay the price. As the reality of my situation sank in, I found myself consumed by a deep, all-encompassing despair. I had lost not only my material possessions, but my sense of self-worth, my dignity, my very identity. Who was I, if not Scarlet Rose Winthrop Ashford, the pampered socialite with a closet full of designer gowns and a husband who doted on her every whim? Without the trappings of wealth and status, I felt adrift, untethered, a mere shadow of my former self. It was during this dark period that I found myself drawn to the music of a band called The Aviators. Their melancholic melodies and poignant lyrics seemed to speak directly to my wounded soul, giving voice to the pain and regret that consumed me. One song, in particular, struck a chord deep within me. It was called Already Gone, and its haunting refrain echoed the very words Aiden had uttered during that fateful phone call. You made your choice, and now you have to live with the consequences. I loved you, I really did but I won't be made a fool of. Not again. As I listened to those lyrics over and over again, I couldn't help but wonder if Aiden had been trying to send me a message, a final warning that I had been too blind or too arrogant to heed. Had he known, even then, that our marriage was doomed? Had he seen the signs of my growing discontent, my wandering eye, and simply chosen to let me go, to spare us both the pain of a protracted, bitter divorce battle? I would never know for sure, but the more I dwelled on it, the more I came to believe that Aiden had loved me in his own way, even as I had betrayed him in the most profound way imaginable. As the months turned into years, I found myself consumed by a deep, gnawing regret. I had sacrificed everything, my marriage, my home, my financial security, for a fleeting moment of passion, a foolish dalliance that had meant nothing in the end. And for what? A few stolen moments of pleasure, a brief respite from the monotony of my life? It seemed like such a paltry prize, such a hollow victory in the face of all that I had lost. As I struggled to rebuild my life, to find my footing in a world that no longer made sense, I found myself drawn to the music of the aviators time and time again. Their songs became a sort of balm for my wounded soul, a reminder that even in the darkest of times, there was still beauty and truth to be found in the world. And as I listened to the haunting strains of Already Gone, I couldn't help but wonder if Aiden, wherever he was, was listening too. If he, too, was haunted by the ghosts of our past, by the memories of a love that had once burned so bright, only to be extinguished by my own selfish desires. In the end, I suppose it didn't really matter. What was done was done, and no amount of regret or self-pity could change the past. All I could do was try to learn from my mistakes, to become a better, wiser, more compassionate person. And as I looked to the future, I found myself clinging to a fragile hope, a hope that one day, perhaps, I might find the courage to seek out Aiden and make amends. To apologize for the pain I had caused him, and to thank him for the love he had once shown me, even as I had thrown it back in his face. It was a slim chance, a faint glimmer of possibility in the darkness that had consumed my life. But it was enough to keep me going, to give me the strength to face each new day with a renewed sense of purpose and determination. For in the end, that was all I had left, hope and the knowledge that no matter how far I had fallen, there was always a chance to rise again, to become the person I was meant to be. Only time would tell. But for now, I would cling to that fragile hope, and let the music of the aviators guide me through the darkness, one haunting refrain at a time. What are your thoughts on OP? Thank you for joining us in our tales where revenge is served piping hot. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more stories that guarantee your satisfaction. 
Stay tuned for the next one to satisfy your appetite for revenge. If you're under 18, brace yourself. It's not for the faint-hearted.